Good morning, everybody. We are live. I am here from The Birdhouse, and I am joined by author extraordinaire Stan Tequila. <laughs> liar, liar. <laughs> Who is joining us today, and he's also going to be giving away a signed book. We've got a signed copy of his new Hummingbirds book. And you can be entered in to win that just by putting in hashtag book in the comments. A few of you guys have already done that. And at the end of the broadcast, we will do a drawing at random. We've got a program that will just draw you at random. And so we can see who wins the book. So feel free to do that. And if you have any questions or comments for Stan, absolutely. You can put those in the comments as well. You probably know him best from his Birds of New York book, which just came out with a new edition Oh, about a year ago or so, I, I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. And it looks like in the new edition, there's there's more birds in it. Is that right? That's basically. Yeah, not only book. more birds, but mm -hmm. it's um, updated maps, um, updated names. It's um, you would think that it wouldn't be, you know, very complicated, but in fact, the even just the naming changes so much on these birds that. Uh, uh, keeping up the latest names is always difficult. And I, I mean, the scientific names, the uh, genus and species name, and then uh, ranges have changed dramatically. And uh, there are birds now in the uh, in the uh, you know New York region that weren't there before, and so those have been added in, and so things like that. And most of my books that I've been updating, the field guides that I've been updating, are anywhere from twenty to thirty years old. So it's oh, uh, wow. it's time to do it. Yeah, my I think my first field guide came out uh, thirty plus years ago, and uh, so updating those is very important. And I've I, some of them I've, I'm on my third edition of uh, of updates too. So there's a lot. Um, I think New York is a third third yep. edition too. Yes, yeah, yep. mm -hmm. it is now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What what um, are there some birds that you're finding that are increasing? Their habitat, like red-bellied woodpecker, is that a good example of one that could be increasing? It's huge. Around. Yeah. Huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. The red-bellied woodpecker is a species that's, you know, kind of really exploded across the range, all United States. And um, on the consequently, on the other hand, the red-headed woodpecker is on its way out. I mean, it is ridiculously low in, um, uh, in population. Yesterday, I was attending a meeting... Um, a nature center directors meeting here in the twin cities uh, for those people watching i'm in minnesota and um, we were at a university of minnesota research station where they do all this research on red red-headed woodpeckers because mm -hmm. they've got a small population that are thriving in this one little spot but nowhere else <laughs> and so they're doing a lot of studies trying to figure out you know what what's going on with this bird because uh, about here in Minnesota, it's a 95% decrease in population. 95. That's wild. <laughs> I mean, not, not 5%, 95% yeah. is just ridiculous. And nobody knows why they are gone. And that is a real issue. So um, people are, are, you know, trying to study that and figure out exactly what's going on. And it's pretty interesting because they occupy the same kind of habitat as the red-bellied woodpecker in general, right? That's exploding in population. Is that a fair thing to say? Similar size bird. Mm -hmm. Both are primary cavity nesters. Both you know, excavate their own cavity so they're not depending upon some other bird. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, both have similar food requirements, same like reproductive ability, all that stuff. And yet one species is doing great and the other one is not. It, it is really a uh, a mystery. Yeah, it'll be interesting. We're actually, New York is going through a breeding bird atlas right now, our third one. I think it's been mm -hmm. maybe like 15 years or so mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, since the last one. So it'll be interesting to see since then how the populations have increased or decreased. Some people are, some people around, especially if they're around the shore of Lake Ontario, have been getting them at their feeders, but it's mm -hmm. super rare. So yeah. it's, it's not a very common book for uh or it's not a very common bird for people to have around here yeah um the, the um ebird has got a new interactive um web page with population trends on range maps hmm. so you can look at your state and see within the state 
where the populations are going up and where the populations are going down. And I find that fascinating. You know, they're using it part of their, um, uh, you know, if you're familiar with eBird, I'm sure. But yeah. they use that data to put in these kind of real time population going up or population going down uh, data in uh, each state. And that's pretty fascinating stuff. Oh, neat. Yeah, I'll have yeah. to check that out. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we uh, talk about eBird here and there. It's, it's a good way to see what kind of birds. Um, if you're kind of unfamiliar with it, if you're looking for a specific bird, it'll show you where they've been reported last or uh, how many have been around. So I use that when I'm doing these broadcasts to see, is anyone seeing red poles? Is anyone seeing evening grosbeaks? We've been getting, um, a few people have seen uh, evening grosbeaks around here. And we just had a sighting of a bohemian waxwing too. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that's been kind of all the, the excitement around yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, so um, as far as migration goes, we get questions here and there from, well, from, from everybody. Um, one question we get a lot, and I'd like to get, you know, your opinion yeah. on it too, to make sure we're not saying anything out of turn, is, uh, you know, people are concerned if I keep my hummingbird feeders out or if I keep, you know, feed, my feeders out for too long, our bird's not going to migrate and we always tell people no no that they're they will they're, they're gonna do their thing but I'm curious <laughs> if you have anything to add to that question. yeah um so uh first of all if people are interested in migration my migration book is um i wrote it in a way look at that look at you i love this book actually i've got a copy of this and i absolutely love this book it's great it Thank you. That that book, yeah. I wrote it in a way that people could understand it and, you know, take out the technical mm -hmm. jargon and, and write it in a, you know, plain, simple way. But basically what you learn in that migration book is that uh, birds are triggered to migrate by the photo period. The photo period is the amount of daylight from sunrise to sunset. And they, mammals like you and I, or let's just say a bear, um, they perceive mammals perceive the photo period by light coming through their eyes. Um, birds, on the other hand, um, don't have that. What they do is they perceive the amount of daylight by perceiving it straight through their brain, right into the hippocampus of the brain uh, through direct exposure to the sunlight. And um, this then um, produces the endocrine system to kick out hormones that get the bird uh, what's called migratory restlessness, where it wants to migrate. So the fact that there is food or not food or whatever it may be, whatever those conditions are, are negligent uh, uh, because it's it's basically following its, its hormones and it's going to mm -hmm. do it. And the analogy I always like to put out is that, uh, you know, when your child was young, you didn't force it to walk you know, make it walk, your child got up and walked, whether you wanted it to or not. Mm -hmm. And these birds are going to migrate whether you do, whether you want them to or not. And so leaving food out for them actually allows them to put on that extra body fat that they need to make that journey. So it's actually critical that you keep this food out for them and not pull it because that's a, a persistent um, kind of uh, myth that you know you have to remove your food to force the birds like hummingbirds to migrate yeah. and, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely false they'll migrate when they're ready to migrate now having said that <clears throat> the last couple of days uh or maybe the last week here in minnesota the tundra swans have been migrating through uh, now here it is what the 19th of uh, november it's pretty late for tundra swans to be migrating through um and they move they migrate I don't know if you know about the tundra swan stuff, but they nest up in Alaska and Utah in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, way up in the tundra. And then they make this like diagonal flight across Canada. They'll 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 do like a two to three day nonstop flight from the Arctic to places like Devil's Lake, North Dakota, or they'll keep going and they'll go down to the Mississippi River between Minnesota and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So tens of thousands of them will then stage there for uh, you know, a week, two weeks, uh, maybe longer. And then they'll make the second part of their leg from Minnesota to the East Coast over to Maryland. A lot of them go to the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland uh, or the banks, uh, the outer banks of North Carolina and things like that. So that's where they'll spend their winters. Now, those birds are coming late. And the reason for that is they've had the migratory restlessness. But what they haven't had is that 
those north winds, those we call them Alberta clippers, where they're pushing hard out of Alberta down into Minnesota. And these birds will take advantage of those storms and ride the front end of them or ride the back end of them. And they'll move along with the storm, helping them to do it. Because if the winds are out of the south, blowing hard, you don't want to be trying to migrate into that because you're gonna, it's going to cost you more in uh, body fat, more energy to keep flying. And when you're doing a three-day, four-day nonstop flight, you need all the energy you can get. And so it's a combination of these things of the weather, the daylight, you know, all these things that kind of put together to make birds migrate. The other thing you got to think about with birds is that most of our birds um, that we have, you know, coming to our backyards, whether it be, you know, a chickadee or a titmouse or whatever it may be, all the way up to tundra swans that are migrating from the Arctic, they've been around from anywhere from three to say upwards of five million years. And they've been doing this for three to five million years. Ruby-throated hummingbirds for a million years have been migrating back and forth. Do you think that your little food offering is going to change that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the problem with people. We think that we are the center of it all, the center mm -hmm. of all, you know, wildlife and nature and, you know, and we're, but we're not, you know, mm -hmm. we're just a small cog in that big wheel of nature too. I mean, we're the cog that messes things up all the time, <laughs> right. but we're still there, you know. <laughs> So it's probably just and the same goes for when they come back up during the spring migration, they get that restlessness again and mm -hmm. it's time for them with the right conditions to come back. And they do based on the weather. We're always looking at um, bird cast. Everybody is always excited. When are the hummingbirds going to arrive? Yeah. When are the Orioles? And mm -hmm. uh, it's usually around the same exact day every year, which is yeah. pretty wild. Um, it really doesn't change. Yeah, that's interesting, too. So it'll be in reverse um, as the daylight is getting longer and longer and longer towards springtime, again, that photo period will trigger the uh, migratory restlessness and the birds will start to get moving. Now, spring migration is often very different from the fall migration. Fall migration is okay, okay, we'll get there when we can get there. Just hold on to your feathers. We're getting there, you know, <laughs> type of thing. And we'll move along. Spring migration is a sprint. It's like, got to go fast, as fast as you can go. The, 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 the ones who get to the uh, breeding grounds get the best territories and have the best food opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me, and the best ability to uh, reproduce. So spring migration is go, 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 go. Whereas fall migration is all right, all right, we'll get there when we get there type of thing. And so there is a little bit of a difference uh, uh, there going on too. And another question we get is, say we're having a mild winter, people go, oh, does that mean... Orioles are going to be here sooner or hummingbirds, but they seem to come around the same time every year, which makes sense if it's based on light and it's a long distance to travel. It seems like they can't just go, Oh, it's nice. I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit early and arrive, you know, a month ahead of time or so. It seems like they still arrive the same besides, time. Besides how do they know what the weather is like in New York? When right. True. In the tropics, That's true. You know, they don't, <laughs> you know? That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But having said that, uh, Studies have shown in the last 25 years, birds are arriving anywhere from one to two weeks ahead of what they have mm -hmm. historically mm -hmm. and are staying one to two weeks longer than they have, too. So we are seeing some adaptation to our climate changing, and that's just how it is, where, you know, the, the climate's changing. Birds have to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the Nature Center, we always, you know, we teach the, uh, the acronym MAD, you know, for, for survival. Um, for, you know, you either, you know, mad is you either migrate, you adapt or you die. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it is, it's very important and the birds are adapting. See, that's the problem with climate change is that it's happening so rapidly. It's happening so quickly that uh, nature is not used to adapting and evolving and changing that quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, it's looking like a lot of the birds are picking up on it and are adapting as fast as they can. So, I mean, if there's a ray of, of you know, hope in there that's part of it uh so the birds are arriving slightly er earlier you will probably see that but remember that's on average mm -hmm. okay on average which means it <laughs> what it doesn't mean is every single year it means on average that means some years they're going to be early some years they're not and mm -hmm. so on average they're on average it's slightly shifting towards 
the earlier dates than um, than they did in the past. Gotcha. See, and, uh, again, that's the one thing about with people. People, we're, we're, we're so, I don't know, we're so black and white. We're so right and wrong. Uh, no shades of gray, no maybes, no depends upons. We are just this way or that way. And mm -hmm. nature is everything in between. And so we really don't, uh, when we try to inject our human experience, our human interface on, um, on nature, we're almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, this kind of question kind of rolls into that with, uh, you know, talking about birds being dependent on people. Like if we leave our feeders out too long, we get the question, say, you know, we, it's, winter time and we have a bad storm people go oh gosh if you know if i let my feeders run dry are all the birds are they dependent on it are they going to die that's another big concern people have or if they're going on vacation and they yeah. can't leave their hummingbird feeders out um yeah. so what do you have to say about about that question? i say that birds have wings and they know how to use them so if the food runs out at your feeder, guess what do they do? Right. <laughs> they just fly right over to the next door neighbor's <laughs> feeder yeah. or to the next or the natural food source and, yeah. and they go up there. But then when you get back and you fill up your feeders, guess who comes right back? Mm -hmm. uh, they do. They don't have any problems with it. Um, so, again, we'd mentioned a lot of these birds are millions of years old. And we as a society have been feeding birds since shortly after World War II. Prior, prior to World War II, as a nation, we didn't grow enough food to feed ourselves, let alone give it away to wildlife, you know. And as a nation, we didn't have disposable income just to buy food and give it away uh, yeah. to wildlife. That This is all modern time stuff. We've only been backyard bird feeding for about 70 years. And um, and so those things, we we haven't been feeding birds long enough to even kind of begin to change their their behaviors. There's, having said that, there's been a number of studies done in uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, where they did, uh, they looked at birds that come to feeders, because you got to keep in mind, not every bird comes to a feeder. Sure. And of the birds that come to feeders, they're only deriving about 25% of their diet from that feeder. 75% of it's still coming from the wild. So remember why you're feeding birds. You're feeding birds for you to draw them closer so that you can see them, you can enjoy them. <coughs> excuse me and that feeling that sense of um <coughs> bringing nature in closer one second here mm -hmm. so feeding birds is really for yourself to connect yourself with nature to you know soothe your soul to have that connection and i i get it you know um i've fed birds my whole life and it it's something that I enjoy doing and it, you know, it's one of those things is that you, you maybe you can't explain it and you can't put a, a word on it, but you know it when you feel it. And this right. is definitely one. Yeah. And, and yeah. watching those birds in the backyard, you feel it and you go, and I'm sure everybody here probably um, uh, feels the same way. I mean, you don't know why you feed the birds. You just do, you know, <laughs> right. you, like it, you like it. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. Mm hmm it's got some kind of inherent value we can't put a you know a, a name to or you know right, right. exactly mm -hmm. yes if any of you guys online have any questions for stan feel free to put them in the comments and absolutely make sure you put in that hashtag book in order to be entered to win a uh, signed copy of his new hummingbirds book this is a fairly new book that just came out i think this past spring is that right um no i think the summer here oh, the summer. Yeah, brand new Ooh. Mm -hmm. so are you working on some new titles as well i'm working on a book on bears right now um which is which is fun mm -hmm. and uh, i've got a lot of um of books out there for uh christmas gift ideas if people are looking i've got a whole new series of um kids guide to the birds of different states this one's carolinas whoops carolinas and missouri and um, I have them for about 15 states, I think it is. Um, so, you know, wherever you're at, um, I'm pretty sure we have a kid's guide to New York, don't we? 
I don't know. If you do, it must be brand new because we don't have it yet. I'm not sure if there is one. I got, um, yep, I got one. Let me look here. One. Oh, okay. Yeah. So even if you're watching from a different state, like we were, we always talk about this Birds of New York guide, which everybody loves because it's all organized by color. So say you see a bird that is red or a bird that has blue on it, you just flip to that section, the little color and the bird. Um, is right there. So we talk about this book all the time, but you've got them for almost every state. So anytime I go on vacation yeah. somewhere, um, I always pick up whatever that guide is, you know, birds of Montana, birds of Alaska, whatever mm -hmm. that might be, which is super helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have the kid's guide to birds of New York, but you can guarantee it's going to be on its way. Um, New York is a big state uh, for me. And so I'll be spending a lot of time uh, uh, putting that together too. So okay. kids got kids books are, are always, um, if you're looking for just a kind of a fun little general uh, book, here's Bird mm -hmm. Trivia. You know what I like about this? I wrote this with America in mind because, you know, a lot of trivia books with birds, they say things like, what's the largest bird? Well, of course, you know, it's the ostrich, but mm -hmm. you know, we have an ostrich here. So I did it for North America. So it's, it's you know, facts about North American birds. So Very it, nice. Yeah, it's yeah that's a, a popular one. Yeah, people yeah. love that that title. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites for kids. I get this for everybody that um, ah, yeah. or has a kid or, you know, has a new baby or whatever. I always get this one. C is for Cardinal. This is like my go-to book that you've done. So you've got kids' books, too. It's not just yeah. all books for, um, mm -hmm. for adults. Yeah, so I have that one, and I also have a... Um, accounting book uh it's called can you count the critters and it's a book for uh, learning how to count so for children to learn how to count and then uh, the one you put up is learning their abcs and then of course there's the literary classic <laughs> which everybody's uh everybody needs on their shelves both uh children and adults alike would like you like it. to speak about this book do you have yeah. my to say about, literary about classic <laughs> Yes. Uh, so Whose Butt is uh, my most popular children's book. It's a book about animal butts. Uh, it came about because while I was photographing whatever animal, no doubt they would always turn around and I and I would just I would take pictures of their butt. I just thought they were cute, you know, and, <laughs> and I liked it. I, I don't know. You, that's why you got to you got to do what you like and the heck what everybody else thinks type of thing, you know, and because I'd be shooting. I'd be photographing with other, other photographers and, you know, the animal would turn around and they'd kind of like, you know, uh, and mm -hmm. I would be still shooting and they'd be like, what are you doing? And I said, leave me alone. I'll, you know, I'll do what I want to do. <laughs> I'll do my own shooting and you do your shooting. And um, so I do remember going to my publisher. I didn't think that they would like it. And um, yeah. I said, well, here's this concept. This is this idea that I've had. And um, I said, but again, I'm not sure you're going to like it. And then I said, it's about animal butts and they just went, ah, we'll take it. Oh my gosh. You know, I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> they jumped all yeah. over it. So. I believe it's one of our best sellers actually here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great selling book. How mm -hmm. long have you been uh, taking photos? Like when, how long have you been doing photography for? Well, um, so I've been doing photography my entire life, um, professionally uh, for about 40 years. Um, I, so I started back in the film days, um, you know, doing all the um, 35 millimeter slide stuff. So I would take these massive, you know, trips to Alaska and bring 250 rolls of film with me. You know, it was, you know, I was not a fan yeah. of film. <laughs> I really wasn't. And then I think it was 1999, 2000, uh, the first kind of semi-professional digital cameras came out. I ran to digital. I did not like film. I didn't like the cost involved and the unknown and everything yeah. about it. And I ran to digital and... Uh, the year 2000 and uh, switched over to digital right away and uh, loved it, you know, and, and now 20 plus years later, we have another revolution, not evolution, revolution with the mirrorless cameras. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, so, I've heard a little bit about them, but I really don't know the difference between so the, the last 20 plus years. We've all been shooting what's called DSLRs. Yeah. These are digital single lens reflex cameras. Mm -hmm. And um, it has a mirror inside the camera that would flip out, out of the way so that it would expose the sensor behind it. And then the mirror would go down again. Mm -hmm. Well, these new cameras are now referred to as mirrorless because they don't have that mirror inside that goes up and down. And therefore, they're mirrorless cameras. And it is a total game changer. And it is a the, the, the 
it is completely, it's like starting over again. It mm. really truly is. It is the technology is remarkable. I switched over about two years ago um, to uh, to the mirrorless and, and got rid of all my DSLRs. And again, I saw the technology, I understood it, and I ran to it. And I was like, "That's what I want." Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's great stuff. And I I ran to it, and so <clears throat> I I enjoy the mirrorless. It is it's remarkable technology, mm. and uh, we've. So things have changed a lot. Yeah. I mean, I went from, you know, slide films where I would have, um, well, gosh, uh, I don't know, tens of thousands of slides on file. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know if you can, well, maybe you can see it, but see right back there, see the file cabinet right, yeah. right there. Yeah. So those, those are all file cabinets that were just stuffed with, um, um, with, with slides. And mm -hmm. uh, and then in order to send them to an editor, I'd have to take them and protect them and put them in a package and mail them. What? <laughs> it would take forever. You yeah. Know? And, and then they would hang on to them for six months. Yeah. You know, before yeah. they would finally return them to you and all that. Right. And if that was the only picture you had of that bird or that animal, mm -hmm. guess what? It was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. Nowadays, holy mackerel, digital. Yeah, click, 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 click. You're halfway around the world. Here's a whole selection of pictures. Bam, done. It, <laughs> it's remarkable. It, it, truly it, is. it is. It's insane. Yeah, yeah, if you guys have any um, questions for Stan, you can absolutely put them in the comments here. Um, you do have a few comments. Stacy says, love the way you talked about feeding the birds for ourselves and our enjoyment. So true. I will try to feel less guilty when I can't get to fill the feeders every day. So there you go. <laughs> Done yeah. some, you know, people have some, you know, ease of mind here. Yeah. I do have one exception to that is, and that's my flying squirrels. I, oh, my, okay. my flying squirrel. I have flying squirrels at my house and I feed them every night and they are my babies. And, oh. and I'm out there every night. I mean, I, I don't want to miss a night. I mean, I, it's like, no, I got to go home. I have to go feed my, feed my flying squirrels. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I we've got flying squirrels. customers that get them at their, mm -hmm. so they are definitely around. They're oh, yeah. nocturnal though. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's three species of flying squirrels in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. um, mainly two, the northern flying squirrel, the southern flying squirrel. And the southern flying squirrel is found throughout the entire eastern half of the United States. So it's found all over the place. And um, they are spectacular. I just love those little guys. They're just adorable. You can sometimes kind of hear them chattering in oh, the tree, gosh. too. Um, yeah. yeah, I've never actually seen one, but I heard one once in my backyard chattering. And it's a very high-pitched, yeah. <laughs> very high-pitched little uh, squeak, if you will. Uh, Joey has a, has a question here, a photography question. He says, generally speaking, what is the best time of day to photograph raptors hunting? So if you're trying to get uh, owls hunting, it's going to be uh, in the evening or uh, morning right away because they're, um, you know, generally nocturnal. Um, if you're talking about hawks, it can be at just about any time, really, um, because the, uh, they, generally speaking, hawks are not, um, they're kind of more midday hunters. They're not like uh, crepuscular. They're not in the morning, in the evening. They are kind of in the middle of the day, so um anytime you can get to them is when i <laughs> was when i go for it um like for example uh we should be seeing uh rough-legged hawks coming down from the arctic here soon and these birds come down to places like new york and uh, you know the northern tier states basically and uh i mean it's good to see them at middle of the day you know get out there on a nice cloudy day and there and there they are out hunting in the middle of the day so uh each species is a little different so you get out there and when you, and that's the main thing is know your subject first, then go out. Your chances of becoming more successful at capturing photographs is, is by knowing what the species is first. So, yeah. Have you guys had any um, eruptive visitors come through? Like, do you guys get evening gross beaks in the winter months, for example? Well, we used to <clears throat> in the seventies and eighties, every Winter, we'd have evening gross peaks coming through. Not, now we don't anymore. Um, evening gross peak populations are down about 90% also. Um, and it's it's crazy. You know, um, they're almost all gone. Uh, we uh, So far this year, we are definitely seeing red-breasted nuthatches, which uh, are eruptive. They come out of the range and then they uh, uh, interact. 
but so far we haven't seen a whole lot of everything else um so it's still a little early uh for us about uh, december is when things really start to kick in we start seeing those um you know uh, pine siskins and red poles and all those pine grow speaks and all those things coming in too um ed who's a fellow photographer here says stan i'm still using a dslr Nikon 850, what do you like about the mirrorless cameras? How do they affect your shooting and processing? Yeah, so the Nikon uh, 850 is legendary camera. Um, it is, I think it's one of Nikon's best ones. Even though it's not their top of the line camera, it's still probably one of their absolute best performing DSLRs by far. Um, <clears throat> but it's comparing apples and oranges when you compare DSLRs to the uh, mirrorless. Uh, the focusing system is utterly different, and until you try it, you won't realize. And the moment you try it is the moment you literally it'll be it'll be like light bulbs going off, and you're gonna go, "Oh my gosh, why haven't I <laughs> done this sooner?" Um, the the focus tracking is unbelievable. Um, they have something called, uh, animal eye detection. So it detects the eye on the animal and literally will lock onto the eye of the animal. You don't have to do anything hmm. and it'll just follow it around and it'll, it'll increase your number of sharp shots, uh, taken dramatically. So, I mean, and then there's just so many other great things about the uh, mirrorless, uh, that is, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's just one of those things where, until you try it, 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 you'll realize. And they have silent shooting now. And so most people, which is funny because people thought, well, man, you probably wouldn't be doing that. But now, uh, most because these cameras, these um, these mirrorless cameras have an electronic shutter. And they most of them shoot anywhere from 20 to 40 pictures per second silently. So you don't hear a thing. You, you just push the button and nothing. You, I mean, you can see this little blinking going on around the box of the, mm -hmm. when you're looking through the camera, but that's it. And, oh, wow. you know, and shooting 30 frames a second. Holy mackerel. As a follow-up, that is asking, what cameras do you shoot? Oh, I'm Canon. Have been for over 40 years. Um, the Canon R5 is um, uh, and the R3 are both legendary cameras now. They, uh, R5's been out for about two and a half years, and it is hands down. I I mean, Ed, no, I'm not not knocking. I don't care what brand you go with. It, don't, it doesn't make any difference to me whatsoever, but I know so many of my Nikon friends who jumped Nikon over to Canon just because of that R5 body. That R5 body is unbelievable. And the video, oh my gosh, the video. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to any rate. So, yeah. And Duster says, is it okay to just use your phone camera? Absolutely. Are you yeah. kidding? <laughs> there are many times where I was out photographing white-tailed deer about a week or so ago and had this incredible sunset. And, um, uh, you know, I was like, I know what the best camera is for this. I whipped out my phone because, you know, I mean, you can shoot with most of these phones these days, you know, you're shooting 45 megapixel cameras, you know, in the, in the phone. Mm -hmm. with you know hdr settings with everything it's camera phones are amazing yeah it's incredible like how they've replaced the point and shoot uh totally point shoot cameras completely yeah, yeah, exactly couldn't agree yeah. more so if any of you guys have any other questions or comments you can absolutely put them in there um another thing i wanted to ask you and and um a common question we get is we sell a lot of products that have hot pepper mixed into them. So we yeah. sell bird seed with, you know, the hot pepper in there. So the squirrels don't go, um, go for it. And the birds don't taste it, but does it affect the birds in any way? That's been a concern for people. And I, I get that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, truly is. It is. Um, I, I've only tried it once uh, for, for, I don't know, about a month or so. And I switched over trying to use that. And um, what I found was my squirrels uh, loved it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I, I wrote a tongue in cheek newspaper article about the, you know, fire breathing squirrels from hell um, because they, they would, they just chow down on it. And um, you know, um, it, it, but for me, um, Squirrel proofing my feeders 
So simply putting out some baffles on the feeders and then trimming branches around them so that the squirrels can't jump to them. Done. Finished. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I have, I can look out my window here. I can count them up. I think I've got maybe 10 feeders just all together. And I've got it in a small little clearing in my yard. And so squirrels never get on it. I fill up my feeders with the bird, the premium bird food that I would like. And then what I honestly, what I'll do is I'll take cheap bird food or cracked corn or whole corn or something like that. And I scatter it on the ground for the squirrels yeah. because otherwise if you don't, the squirrels are sitting on the ground going, trying to figure out just yeah. planning. How do I get to those feeders? And if you give them enough, you know, cheap food on the ground, they don't think about it as much and it really works out well. So uh, and that's what I do. It's just simple squirrel guard, and it, and it really works well. Gotcha. So, um, having said that, um, it's always been assumed that birds have reduced ability to smell. And we've based that on the fact that they have a, a much fewer taste buds than what you and I do. So, for example, uh, they say on average hummingbirds have about 10 to 20 taste buds on their tongue where you and I will have anywhere from 6,000 to 8,000 super tasters up to 10,000 taste buds on your tongue. So they did this correlation. And um, so we, we've always assumed a couple of things that birds have very little to, you know, ability to taste. When I was in college, and this was, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we did studies with hummingbirds and feeders and concentrations of sugar. We took 10 identical feeders, we took a two by four with hooks in it. And then we did different concentrations of sugar in each of the feeders mm -hmm. and put them up in random orders and observed the birds as which one. And it was amazing to see the birds going down, testing all of the, and then just going right to the one that had the most sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's the one they concentrated on the most. And that's the one that they drained first. 10 Every taste time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 10 taste buds and they, I mean, really, how do they do that? How do they know? I mean, they, that suggests to me, I mean, do you think you could taste the difference in a one part or, you know, uh, I guess it'd be a 10th of a part difference in sugar. I, I doubt that anybody could do that. And we have all these taste buds in their tongues, but yet the birds were able to do it. So I find that very fascinating. And then lately the last month or so, I've been doing a lot of research and reading and studies on uh, because we think birds have reduced ability to taste, we've always assumed birds have virtually no ability to smell. Yeah. And, and what they do is they look at what's called the olfactory uh, node in the brain. With mammals, the olfactory node is quite large, especially in comparison to our brain. Uh, but with birds, the olfactory node is quite small in comparison to their brain. And so we've really used those two things, reduced taste buds, tiny little olfactory node in their brain, to say birds really don't have much ability to smell. However, <laughs> what we're finding out now is that under controlled conditions and studies doing with birds, it's turning out that the birds actually have the ability to smell. And so it's really kind of turning everything on its head and how they're doing it is not on, is not known yet. So, how does that, um, this, like, for example, does a turkey vulture have a larger node because they are, they are in search of, uh, you know, dead, dead decaying things. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. larger in, in them? Do you know? It's slightly larger, but not like it is for a mammal. Hmm. So and this is again, where we always get in trouble. We always get in trouble by trying to compare like us, yeah. mammals, to birds. And it's really not the same. They're really mm -hmm. very, very different. And I don't know why we haven't kind of <laughs> realized the fact that, hey, guess what? We're, you know, we always seem to get this wrong. Birds yeah. can see <laughs> things we can't see. Birds can hear things we can't hear. Why can't they taste things we can't taste? Why can't they smell things we can't smell? So some very interesting things going on in in the olfactory 
studies of birds uh, and expect to see in the next coming years a lot of changes in those ideas that we've had. And that happens. It happens all the time. That's what science is. Science moves forward and corrects itself and learns and things like that. So that's what it's all about. Yeah, that, that'll be interesting to see if uh, what comes of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Joey also asks, do you ever do workshops, photography workshops? I need some Yes, I do workshops all the time. Um, in fact, I leave Thanksgiving morning, Thursday morning. I'm heading out for Costa Rica, and I'll be gone for a couple of weeks um, doing a photo tour in Costa Rica. This winter, I'll be three weeks in Yellowstone, and then I'll do another 10 days in Alaska for um, bald eagles and sea otters. And so I do a lot of these things. Uh, people can go to my website, naturesmart.com, and I have... Um, listed there the um i do locally here in minnesota uh loon photography workshops western grebe photography workshops and black bears and they can get more information simply by going to naturesmart.com and um it fills up quickly every year and um they're they're fun uh, if you like loons or or black bears it, this is the place to be and uh, so I live right on a lake and I you know, bring you right to the loons and they have babies riding on their back. All those things you'd ever want, you know, <laughs> to see uh, like that. Here, I'll show you. Here, quick. Here's the third book I did on loons. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. And New York, you guys got you've got loons, too. Yeah. You know. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Like um, we've got the common loon. We've got red throated loon. Um, yeah, during migration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're around. They're yeah. definitely around. Yeah, we've got yeah. your other, our love of loons. Oh, yeah. We've got that one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those grebes, they have kind of a, a crazy mating dance, right? Is that mm -hmm. those that they kind of like go up on their legs and. Yeah, the Western grebes are, um, <laughs> yeah, they, it's called rushing, where they run on the surface of the water and uh, with their heads and necks, you know, kind of like that. And they run along. It, spectacular um that was one of the things when i was a kid um uh disney walt disney used to be um on sundays at like five o'clock and um it was something you looked forward to all week long and you know you could they always had a you know a disney special on and one time they did one where they showed western grebes running the rushing on the water to some classical music there was time to the music things. And I remember as a kid watching that and thinking, wow, that is amazing. And, and it really stuck with me. And, you know, decades later, I, I get to go out and photograph them doing that. And I, th I think yeah. that's really fun. They're, it's really a neat, they're really an interesting bird. Uh, mostly what we get with uh, on my Western Grebe photography workshops are babies riding on the back, um, mm -hmm. you know, parents feeding the babies and things like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, we've got um, lots of pied build grebe mm -hmm. around here where uh, people can see that kind of thing. Pied bills are tiny little things. Western grebes are really big. Big. <laughs> yeah. And the pied bills don't uh, rush, run on the water like that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Ed says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to put your migration and hummingbird books on my Christmas wish list. Yeah, this book is awesome. I love this migration book. Yeah. And it talks about how like there's different types of migration, how some birds just move a, a little bit further south. Like what's a good um, like bluebirds, like some people around here, like, Ed, Ed, for example, gets bluebirds all winter long. Um, but some of them go south, but they don't go like all the way south to, say, like Central and South America. What um, what did they just kind of go south enough to find better resources or? Um, yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? So. There's all sorts of different types of migration. There's a complete migration where it's, um, we're talking like hummingbirds and warblers, mm -hmm. uh, orioles who leave the north northern states and head down to the tropics for the winter time. Um, and, and that's what the classic migration is. But um, a lot of birds are only do a partial migration where yeah. they're going to leave the northern states and go 500 miles, 700 miles, 800 miles, whatever it is, south to a point where they can eke out a living for the winter time, excuse me, winter time, and then head back. So, uh, and then you have 
these eruptive migrations where some birds only like migrate out every five to 10 years. Um, there's all sorts of different types of migration. So, and that I, I enjoyed writing that migration book so much because it gave me an outlet to be able to kind of lay out that whole idea behind migration. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, 10,000 plus birds, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 10,000 plus birds in the world. And 40% uh, of them migrate. So that's nearly half. So if migration was not a viable alternative, it would have died out a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but it, it isn't. And I mean, almost half the birds migrate, so it, it must work. So the when you do a cost-benefit analysis of it, the benefits of migrating must outweigh the cost of migrating. Because when you think about it, migration is unbelievably difficult. For a lot of the birds who are just hatched, they're traveling thousands of miles to places they've never been to before. How do they know how to do that? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's crazy stuff. Um, and so it, it, I find it endlessly fascinating with migration. And I love seeing it. And I love witnessing it and, and seeing all the intricacies of, of migration. And kind of speaking on that, we've got, this will probably be our final question here before we do the book drawing. Um, uh, Freda says, we are considering going to Kearney, Nebraska to see sand cranes. Any recommendations to help us plan a trip? Yeah, it's Kearney, Nebraska. Um, <clears throat> I led trips there for 30 years and then stopped with the pandemic. Uh, and haven't, haven't started back up again. And I, I probably will start back up in the next year or two, but I won't, I, for the 30 years I led trips to Nebraska for cranes, it was for birding, bird watching, uh, and probably I'll start up offering photography trips to Nebraska. Um, so we've got your, uh, cranes book yes. here too, cranes, herons. Egrets are some of these from Nebraska, some of these photos that are Absolutely. in here probably. <laughs> Tons of them, yeah. Um, over a half a million sandhill cranes come through Nebraska in the springtime. It is a once-in-a-lifetime bucket list trip that you shouldn't miss. Um, and you should definitely go. Um, and it's, you know, it's just one of those things where when you see it, you know, it's when you know, the jaw falls open and you're like, mm -hmm. wow. You know? <laughs> It's pretty spectacular. It's well, well worth it. And depending on what time of year you go, uh, it can be darn cold or it can be darn nice. So, okay. Because it's usually in the month of March. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Lynn does have one question also. It's a controversial subject, she says. What are your thoughts about fireworks disrupting bird habitats and migration? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, so I live on a lake and um, I have nesting osprey on my property and I have loons and bald eagles and I mean, just about anything you can imagine. And it's the nature of people. I, I don't do it. I'm not a fireworks person, but it's the nature of people who come to visit the lake, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, they're going to the cabin. Uh, they shoot off fireworks constantly. And it's just one of those things. Uh, I have one neighbor, who um, who puts on a fireworks show that lasts for about 45 minutes. It's a professional show. And all the homeowners around the lake gather their boats up and sit out in front of his beach, and he puts on this big show. I fortunately can see it from my deck, so I just sit on my deck and watch it. And I enjoy the show, and I think about that every time. But come morning, birds are still there. Things are still happening, you know, and I don't know if they're adapting to it or mm -hmm. just didn't directly impact them. I mean, we're talking from fireworks to my uh, nesting ospreys. I don't know, less than a quarter mile, you know, I mean, you can you can see it. I mean, you easily see it. And um, so I don't I don't know the answer there. I, I would prefer not to have the fireworks, <laughs> but you know it's people and that's what yeah. people do so we're it's like okay you know so i i have not seen any detrimental effects from it um frankly i think it would affect the mammals a little bit more i mean yeah. take a look at your dog 
you know, some dogs are freaked and some dogs aren't. And so really, I mean, I think it would really affect the mammals more so than the birds, especially the birds who are sleeping at night, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I wish I had a better answer for that. And as far as I know, there's been no studies done on that. So Okay. Uh, Duster says, this reminds me of the movie On Golden Pond. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and... uh Ed says, thanks, Liz and Stan, for the great broadcast. Lots of fascinating and new-to-me information. So um, a lot of people have been saying thank you on here. Uh, but we can we could do the drawing, actually, for the, for the book. We've got a bunch of people who've entered. Um, you still have a couple moments if you want to win this signed copy of Stan's Hummingbirds book. Just put the uh, hashtag book just like this in the comments and you will be entered into winning the book uh, do you have so besides your bear book are you working on some other titles as well before yeah um uh, i'm doing updates uh, second and third editions to birds of massachusetts uh, birds mm. of new jersey um right now in fact i just finished those up um and um i can't even remember there's so many <laughs> other things i've I just, they throw these things at me and they, re and they know I'm leaving for a trip. So they're just throwing things at me to keep me busy so that they have things to do while I'm gone. So, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I can't even keep up with it though. I do have some other fun books like uh, start mushrooming. It's the easiest way to uh, start collecting mushrooms, uh, edible mushrooms and not kill yourself. That's oh yeah. Important. That's, that's good. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I got wolves, coyotes, and foxes. This is a new book also. Uh, that's just coming out right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kind of covers all the things you, I'm kind of a wolf person, you know, I really enjoy uh, the wolves, especially living in Minnesota, you know. And then um, one other thing I could show you then too is of course, the bald eagle book. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those um, kind of a coffee table book that uh, people would really enjoy too. So. Very, very cool. Yeah. We've got that bald eagles book here too. That's a good one. That's, that's been a popular one that we mm -hmm. just started carrying. People love eagles. That's all there is to it. They just absolutely love them. And I, I, I can see why, really. They're such majestic, you know, cool birds. Truly are. It never gets old, really, when you see one. Yeah. It's always kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is this is very exciting. This is the first time we've ever done a giveaway like this. Are you, are you super excited? Like yeah, that? I am. Look at this. <laughs> So um, everybody who put in the hashtag book. Change my glasses. Then, here yeah, so we can see who the winner is. How many is. entries? 18? There's, yeah, 18 people entered to win. And so I'm just going to click this button, and it's going to go through. Oh, fun. And we'll see who the lucky winner is of the book. Susan. So <laughs> Susan Comstock is the lucky winner. You get <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, how exciting. So, Susan, we'll be in contact with you about um, how to get you the book. If you're local, um, you can come pick it up or we can send it out to you. So that. Oh, how cool is that? Congratulations, That's Susan. Cool. That's pretty yeah, darn Susan, amazing. awesome. And thank you, Stan, for giving us this nice signed copy of your hummingbirds. Absolutely. Book. Yeah, my, so, my pleasure. Looking forward to that. And, yeah, if any of you guys are looking for a good um, a good field guide, for especially for somebody that might be just getting into birding, or intermediate birding, this Birds of New York, you cannot go wrong with it. It's a fantastic, fantastic guide. And if you're going anywhere on vacation, uh, Birds of Florida, we sell a lot of too. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really good one. Um, consider picking up some of Stan's titles. We can always get, and if you're going to a random state, we can always get the book for you. So we're happy to do that as always here at the Birdhouse. Support um, your local bird stores. Um, that's what I always say. Yeah. We appreciate that. And actually, now that it's getting colder, we're seeing heated bird baths. People are starting to buy those heated bird baths. Mm -hmm, it's un mm -hmm. unfortunately that time of the year where it's starting to get uh, a little bit chilly at night and those bird baths are going to be freezing over. So we've got plenty of those here for you guys if you're looking for those. Um, but it looks like um, we've got a lot of people just saying thank you and congratulations to Susan. Uh, but thank you, Stan, for joining us today, for taking some, some time out and for chatting with us. We love your books and uh, we'll hope you have a happy Thanksgiving down in Costa Rica yeah. or on your way down to Costa Rica. Yeah, I, I leave <laughs> early morning, Thursday, Thursday morning. 
uh, heading to Costa Rica. So, yeah, I'm, I'm taking a group from Europe. Oh. Um, so Thanksgiving doesn't mean anything to them. <laughs> okay. So that's why. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, who would schedule a trip on Thanksgiving? Nobody, uh, except for a bunch of Europeans who don't, um, you know, follow uh, American holidays and things like that. So, yeah, I'll be heading down there. Um, and I always love Costa Rica. It's such incredible birds and that's where the, we're going there specifically for the birds. So I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, how neat. I'd love to We touch base with you after the trip and we can see maybe some of your Costa Rica photos. That would be. Oh, that'd awesome. be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if people are interested in your different trips and things that you lead, they can go to your website, which is naturesmart.com. Yeah, naturesmart mm -hmm. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will let you get on to your day. If you guys are around in the Rochester area, we do have an, another author event happening at the store today. We've got local woman Vivian Van Veld, who has done some um, kind of a uh, books for early readers about a squirrel um, that causes mayhem, which is something that we can all um, probably relate to. So she's doing a book signing here until one o'clock. So if you've got anyone in your um, in your family that's uh, an early reader, you know, around seven, eight years old or so, these are the perfect books for them. She'll be here. And we've got food. We're giving out um, free birds and beans coffee. And we've got hot mulled cider and some food. So come on in and uh, and have a good good Saturday here at the birdhouse. So Support your local here. authors too. You know, I mean, because you get local authors that come in. How how often? Or how awesome is that? Go in and support your local authors. We actually, um, we've got a local uh, couple, Randy and Nick Minotaur, who just came out with a book, backyard birding, backyard birding and butterfly gardening. Um, so we've got that here as well, and they do all kinds of different guides of um, national parks. So we're lucky to have. Um, those local authors here too. We've got a bunch of their books, including one on hiking waterfalls of New York. If you guys are interested in that, that's a really great guidebook as well. So we've got all kinds of stuff here <laughs> at the birdhouse, but um, thank you again, Stan, for joining us and we will sign off. And um, if you want to share this with any of your friends, you can, it'll be on our Facebook page and YouTube. So you can share it with anybody who might have missed it. And congratulations, Susan, on winning the book. We'll be in touch about how to get that to you. So uh, thank you again. And we will log off and we'll talk to you later. Thanks for everybody attending. See you. Bye-bye.